the 1984 has begun. You can feel it. <laughs> oh, it's it's worse. <laughs> Again, because you're living it, because you're like in the movie, Tarl. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> I know, I know part of your coping me- mechanism is making videos, and you're excellent at it, and we love you for it. But, like, how do you deal on an emotional level with all of the circus going on right now? Mostly ambivalence, because I see it as unavoidable. Um, this is something that a lot of people, you know, like 1984 sort of stuff, they've been foreseeing it for a long time. It's like... Uh, governments, and here's a prediction, we can see whether it bears out in the next couple of decades, will inevitably have to use more and more censorship as decentralized information transfer continues to gain more and more dominance. They'll have to because those governments that refuse to do so will collapse under the weight of their own scandals. Only a few very, very virtuous governments that are extremely transparent, we think of maybe Iceland or Switzerland, are the only ones that will survive those and cultures where there's no transparency and no expectation, like uh, I mean North Korea, there's no expectation of transparency because it's never existed. So you're kind of talking about morality and kind of the darkness eating itself. Yeah, yeah, things are going to get worse before they get better, and that's that's even while the Western world slowly liberates itself from globalism. Uh, that would just take us down that dark path even more. These states. How is that? These, uh, my idea is states that resist this overwhelming urge for change will do more poorly than those that actually do. Uh, the the uh, destabilization we see here, like uh, the fact that we've elected a populist as opposed to a neoliberal, is nothing compared to the level of instability if the populism or nationalism or whatever it is is suppressed and the government and the uh, media in these states is seen as the culprit of stagnation, then you get an even worse fringe crop up. You don't just get populists or, you know, mundane garden variety nationalism. You get Nazis, you get communists, you get thing you get anarchists and all of these and then they start fighting one another. It just destabilizes further and further. Sweden, I think uh there was a news story I saw earlier that their police there now can no longer cope with the crime rate. And they're actually hiring private business mercenaries. Now, that's exactly what happened in Rome before they collapsed with Alaric. The same people that ended up sacking Rome had been hired by Romans not even a decade prior. And it's happening today in the modern world, and people never could have imagined it would be possible. We're hiring mercenaries, too. We hired them for the war in Iraq. We created ISIS. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the U.S. military. We're uh, massively over budget, larger than the next several militaries combined. We still had to hire mercenaries to do the dirty work because of Uncle Sam's bureaucracy. This is what the world is devolving into. (laughs) And has been for quite some time. Yeah, I was hoping that it was just a a loony tinfoil hat thing when I was younger. I said, well, I'll vote for Obama, I'll vote for change because I want the war to stop and hopefully things will get nice again like they were in the 90s, you know, between uh, uh, before 9-11, but after the fall of the USSR, things were nice and calm for the most part. Said, I want there it was to a be kumbaya like, moment. Yeah, there I, want was- it, I want it to be like that again. I just, I just want some, you know, I want to watch Nickelodeon or something. And it didn't go back to being that way. Things are worse now than they ever were during the Cold War. <laughs> yeah, and let's, let's never want to regress. We can... Yeah nostalgic but let's always move forward (laughs) and the conclusion i came to on that is it's uh, basically the concept of the eternal camp the eternal struggle not to you know say in a hitler sense or something oh well racial nationalism now uh but the struggle is ongoing forever because things always change if they resist change they collapse if they don't resist change it causes friction either way there's struggle and it's ongoing as long as humans exist Well, as long as the third dimension exists, in my opinion. But yeah, yeah, friction is the catalyst of growth. We need fiction, friction to grow the soul. Yeah, and ego, maybe, but soul, I say. Yeah, (laughs) even in a seismic sense, the same force that levels cities builds mountains. Wow, that's very intense. And that brings back when you were talking about the individualized states in the United States of America being their own identities and you know, that could cause, with this new government, with the new president, yeah. Trump, 
each little state can have have its own coup, basically. And so I could see earthquakes politically, uh, political earthquakes, because what do people identify with? This is the thing. Are they identifying with being an American or from being from Wisconsin? Is that more important? Yeah. And if it's from being... Wisconsin, then they're going to be against the whole rest of America. So I see this set up. See, as you put, yeah. See, my prediction on that would be: I don't expect any states to split off. I expect there to be friction, but it'll be, it's, uh, it'll be less than it would have been if Clinton had won. But in these mm-hmm. states, um, you'd think of Austria, where, where Hofer lost. They're the ones that are going to experience more friction. Looking ahead, France could be the big catalyst for the implosion of the EU, regardless of what happens in their election. I think about that. No matter who wins, France probably implodes either way. Well, I would think I've actually had visions of France on fire. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty likely. It's not even fringe to consider that now. We see it. Look at what's happening in the Philippines. You know, Tell with, us. with thousands of people being killed by Duterte's people. Now, I can understand the sentiment of the Filipinos. I can understand that they're tired of addiction, that they're tired of prostitution and pimps and stuff. But at the same time, at what cost are they stopping these things? Uh, Duterte's uh, sort of a populist, a nationalist. And he's decided human rights be damned. And so instead of doing what they had been doing, which is overlooking the fact that there were a lot of drug dealers and cartels in the Philippines, they're now killing them. Uh, they're organizing vigilante raids on drug users as well, forcing them into addiction treatment or into prison if they refuse. And yeah, it's it's a significant uh, concern. Uh, the Democrats have talked about how evil he is. The Republicans have said, "Oh, we should do that here." I'm on neither <laughs> side. I'm on neither side of this. I believe in decriminalizing drugs and giving people treatment, but I can understand why the Filipinos are so tired of this problem. It's just like I can understand uh, why there was a Brexit. I can understand why there were hardcore Trump fans that literally do want to deport millions of people. Uh, Overlooking their concerns is what led to Trump winning anyway. Yeah, so you're seeing this great frustration and unrest. And we talked about French Revolution, and now we're talking about Paris yeah. possibly on fire. I mean, it is. We're going through the spiral again, it yeah. looks like and to me. Yeah, and it's worse here. Days. It's worse here than in Europe. Europe actually has leftists to vote for. So the left can't say, oh, well, you know, we just have two basic parties. The Democrats didn't hire a leftist to go run. So people are saying, oh, if, if they were actual liberals, this wouldn't have happened. Over there, they've actually got leftist movements. They've actually got dedicated nationalist parties here. We've got the Green Party that's a joke, and we've got the libertarian movement that Gary Johnson turned into a joke, and then we've got Republicans and Democrats. You have two bland choices, essentially, for people. Mm-hmm. And I think it has it takes away our sovereignty, any kind of rulership mm-hmm. takes away our own responsibility for being responsible for ourselves, yeah. aren't it? The government's been... Uh, well, bad since after the Civil War, really bad since the atomic era began, and extremely bad since 9-11. And now it's getting even worse. And it's a bit of a farce, though, isn't it? Isn't Because there's a little bit of a joke involved, doesn't that make you feel a little bit more comfortable? Mm, well, it's, you know, it's DC's definitely a farce, that's for sure. I don't know how comfortable it makes me. I think most of these people are jokes. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, there's a little cosmic wink here, there's a little joke here that should say, it's just getting everyone out of the play and saying, wait a minute, this is a play, they're yeah. all fake. <laughs> yeah, uh, who was it who said uh, that when the illusion begins to die, they'll pull back the curtain and it'll expose nothing more than a cement wall? Is that Carlin? I don't know, but... Wow, a cement wall, huh? <laughs> I think uh, there was some comedian who was making a statement about politics. I can't remember which. I believe it was George Carlin. He was as bitter as the Unabomber. It was part of his spice, though. Yeah. Again, I'm going to take back the history lesson of the French Revolution and also the 1920s and the Depression. That has been coming up a lot lately, and even in my own personal life. I went to a speakeasy. I've been hearing the music, and... When the things like that happen to me, like a, a genre of a past comes back in, it's kind of like I'm almost reading the energy of humankind, you know, the collective unconscious yeah. in the stage we're at. And then we 
again, I would say we're at the about at the fall of Rome. We're not quite there yet in America's Rome, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think the empire will split in half this time. I think the world will split in half. But yeah. Hmm. It's got to be a big global change. And I think that's why a lot of people get scared of the new world order because it's an all one kind of thing. And when you're talking about a golden age, you're also talking about an all one kind of thing. Yeah. So, But that's what the darkness and light are always dichotomous in the third dimension. Yeah. Yet if we integrate the fourth dimension and the dichotomy will not be as bad and people can see the game. And I think that's what's happening yeah. physically. I think, uh, you know, was something funny here. What concerns me more, what worries me more than the idea of some Illuminati new world order stuff is the absence of it. Because that means that literal monkeys in thousand dollar suits have their fingers on the nuclear buttons and they're not working together. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's probably even worse than the idea that there is some sort of elite cabal controlling things. At least then somebody's in charge that kind of knows what they're doing. Yeah, you got the capstone at the top of yeah. the pyramid. Yeah, the maybe down. they only seem malevolent. Maybe they're at least trying to do good, but the alternative is even worse. Mm -hmm. I, I, see. I'm more concerned about there being no intelligence and, and, and that these people really do hate each other really are ego-tripping backstabbers and that they are eventually going to wipe one another out with everyone else with them. Uh, if there was no mutually assured destruction, every country on Earth would simultaneously join war against everyone else in a massive imperial purge. They, it, would, it would create a bipolar alliance. You'd probably see the major nuclear states garner their uh, alliances and they'd fight each other and kill just as many people as a nuclear war, maybe more. Wow. You know, I think you really need to write out a video game because you could take SimCity to a whole new level. Yeah. The SimCity cities are doomed, too. It's just a matter of when, <laughs> when Bowser decides to crush it. That's the point. You have a, a very intellect, resting intellect. Yeah. A pessimistic you, one, as you can see. <laughs> well, I think it's because, honestly, I think it's because you're sensitive and because you're a sweetheart. Can I say that? Uh, well, I do like flowers and cats and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, that works. Okay. Shh, don't tell anyone I'm supposed to be a bad dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are scary. Does that help? <laughs> <laughs> Only to the corrupt. Just, okay. Well, no, I mean, really, I'm, like you said, you know, kind of like a light worker, and I had to really check you out a little bit because usually when someone says they're Satanist, they're saying they're an idiot. You <laughs> know that. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a former Satanist. Maybe that helps. I will admit people who think that buying the $200 little red card that's not the smartest thing in the world to do you can get you know all that stuff all the literature for free if you just look up might is right you're getting the same thing as the satanic bible anyway the church of satan is led by idiots mm -hmm. oh well you know i've been in the pagan community since i was a teenager so i've run across many uh different sects of people but mostly you know what it's the new Satanism is chaos magic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or or uh, Joy of Satan. I don't know if they would really qualify as chaos magic. They call themselves Luciferians or Satanists. Uh, they're more, they're actually more pagans, honestly. Well, the thing that I've always taken about Satanists is that it's a service to self. I am the royal, I am the god, and this life is for me. And that was the pursuit of pleasure that I guess you brought up, and that's what I took from the pursuit of pleasure over the pursuit of evolution of one's soul. Mm -hmm. But I think that you are in the pursuit of the evolution of your consciousness. Yeah, because it's pleasurable. But it's an Epicurean pleasure. It's something, you know, thinking about philosophy, you don't need millions of dollars to do that. You don't have to do it in a sports car. Uh, I've told people, like, I would be more at home in a little cottage with a big garden than in a big house with a little garden or something like that. Yeah, I, he I, I heard that video, actually, and I was like, he's just like a gnome. He just wants to live in the woods and be Merlin. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there'd be, there'd be acres of flowers and herbs there. And, you know, that can go back to your grandfather's generation and what they did. Yeah, oh, well, he taught me how to garden, so it works. Wonderful. I did want to get into your childhood if you feel like you have time. Sure. So, Tarl, uh, where did you grow up? And what I'm really wanting to get at here is key 
things that happened to you as you were growing up that made you the man you are today? Well, I grew up in a little village. It's supposedly a town, but it's really a village or <laughs> something smaller than that called Woodstock, Vermont, which for anyone's edification who wonders, it's not the same Woodstock the concert was held at. That was in New York, and everybody asked me about that, so I should probably make that clear. Um, very, very, very small, literally like three inhabited streets, and then a couple little neighborhoods to the side with some homes. That's basically all it was. You know, when the tallest building in the town is three stories high, you know it's very small town America or sub small town. Uh, I grew up relatively poor, which some people found strange. They're like, oh, I couldn't imagine you growing up poor. Well, in the apartment I lived in when I was a kid, um, several springs in a row, when the snow would thaw, there was a waterfall going down my parents' bedroom's wall. Um, wow. And I thought it was hilarious at the time. You know, I didn't know anything else. I didn't know what it was like to be uh, wealthy or even middle class. So I just thought it was funny. I didn't realize at the time, of course, technically I was living in a slum. But I mean, I never wanted for anything. I had, you know, nice clothes and so forth. And we did what we needed to do. But as far as my spiritual development, uh, one time when I was a little kid, I saw what most people would consider to be. And I don't necessarily use this term literally speaking, but I saw a demon in, in literally the Ars Gosha sense appearing in the form of Stolas uh, on my wall at when I believe I was four years old at the time. Uh, what, what does Stolas mean? Stolas is the name of one of the demons of the Ars Gosha. Uh, does it have a certain look? Yes, like an owl. Oh, I see. And uh, interestingly enough, and I didn't realize this at the time because I had never been exposed to the occult. I didn't realize this till well after high school. Uh, this demon uh, in the Ars Gosha is said to impart a knowledge of uh, botanical lore and mm -hmm. geological lore, minerals and plants. And these are two things that when I was growing up, I was absolutely obsessed with. I'm still technically obsessed with them now. Of course, I like growing things. I do like collecting rocks and so forth. I'm interested in learning about both of them. Um, and so that was sort of my earliest exposure to something you'd consider paranormal. I've also spoken about uh, several times as a child seeing a glowing, the, the figure of a glowing wolf outside of my window. Now, I was on the second story a good 15, 20 feet above ground level because it was sort of a not a split level. I don't know what you'd call it. The lowest floor of this building was sunk into the ground. So it was about mm -hmm. 20 feet. It had high ceilings. So it wasn't an actual dog or anything. Uh, and later on, I came to identify it as the exact same semblance of the Fenris wolf on the cover of Radio Werewolf's Fiery Summons, which is an interesting, what you would, what most people would call coincidence. I say synchronicity. So it was white. Yeah, well, it was like a glowing cartoonist uh, outline. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, but not not an actual, like, physical, realistic-looking animal, but more like a drawn figure. Uh, or Patronus, as we've seen in Harry Potter yeah. in the movie. <laughs> Expecto right. Patronum. But, uh, but I've seen those. Yeah. I understand what you're talking about. So did you, like, think that was your power animal? No, well, what I came to realize uh, much, much later on, a few years ago, was that that was around the same time that the final rituals of that actual band were going on, uh, oh. and that I happened to be seeing the exact same figure at the time. And uh, if you listen to these songs, uh, they were written in such a form that they're meant to literally be an occult beacon to call mm -hmm. people forth, to, to impart sort of ability to them, to call them into action as the black-clad legion, uh, as it's referred to actually in several of the songs. Um, so I thought that was interesting once I learned more about it, but I didn't even know that until I think, I think I was 24, 25 years old, you know, fairly recently, <laughs> as opposed to when I was a little kid, I had no clue. I had never been exposed to the occult at all. I used to draw pentagrams on things. I never even saw a pentagram. I had no clue what it meant. Well, isn't Fenris a Nordic god wolf? Yes. It's, uh, the one that I believe, uh, can't remember who it's supposed to devour mm -hmm. time, but yes, it's part of the prophecy of Ragnarok and so forth. Do you have any Celtic or Nordic blood? Uh, I have Anglo-Saxon blood. Close enough, right? Yeah, and, and Germanic blood, so. Well, there you go. Yeah. 
So this might have been an ancestral. Well, that's what I do. That's what I go into. Yeah. Those are the things that I explore. So interesting. Please go on, illuminate more further. Well, it wasn't until I was in high school that I ever encountered occult texts. Um, those were my firsthand experiences. But until I believe 11th grade, and I was a Christian at the time, so I didn't dabble. That's what I'm talking about. Let's go back to your mother's uh, change mm-hmm. <laughs> and how she affected your spirituality, her changes. Yeah, um, she, when I was around 14 or 15, became more religious. We had always been Christians, but we had gone to church, you know, essentially on Christmas and Easter, you know, liberal Christians, not necessarily truly religious. Uh, Around that time, she began reading the Bible more, wanting to go to church more and so forth. And I followed along and I became more religious. I was baptized and so forth. Uh, What was that like? What did you feel about the baptism? Well, well, at the time, I believed in that stuff. So I was like, oh, you know, this is a good thing. It's just my duty. I'm a godly person. (laughs) If you can believe that. So you didn't have an experience or anything. You just got dunked in some water. Nothing I ever experienced within Christianity ever gave me any sort of divine revelation. Um, All of the spiritual things that I've ever experienced have been in lieu of uh, or outside of Christendom, Mm -hmm. honestly. But I used to go to church and so forth. It was non-denominational, marginally Protestant. I was never a Catholic or anything. Um, So I became more religious. But then I realized that it wasn't working for me. Explain what is working. I didn't feel any supernatural tendencies out of it. And it didn't seem to coincide with secularism like science. Mm -hmm. So I became, so at that time, I went more secular and became more atheistic. I considered myself an atheist, even though I was kind of still an agnostic or even an apatheist and didn't care. What age are you? Uh, At that time, I was 18 or 19. And so I went into just studying science. I no longer believed in any spirituality. And then very quickly, it didn't take long, maybe a year, Mm -hmm. um, I realized that was too empty for me, and I wanted at least a mock-up of spirituality. And I happened to have been researching Wicca. I ended up researching Satanism when people were talking about it. I'd never, you know, I'd heard of it before, but I'd never studied about it. And when I read the philosophies of Satanism, I said, well, that's sort of what I believe in anyway. Uh, Respect for nature, don't perturb other people. And what I didn't realize at the time, and this is a funny aside, is it's also literally taken from the same root as modern libertarianism, which I happen to believe. Uh, Might is right is a libertarian and a satanic manifesto at the same time. They are exactly the same thing. Does that mean survival of the fittest, might is right, and ran? <laughs> uh, partially, but it's it goes beyond that. The, the fixation some people have with might is right is, oh, well, that means you should split your enemy's skulls apart. It's, you know, power makes you a god. It's also about leaving one another alone, though, uh, honestly. It's about tempering that, too. Use your common sense. Leave others alone. Yes, you should do what you want to do, but you shouldn't inconvenience others when they want to do what they want to do. Uh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't like- harm the world and, and nature and so forth, either, because that ruins it for yourself and others. Wow. But it's kind of like a gangster mentality or philosophy. <laughs> it can be, yeah. Some people uh, misconstrue it that way. The more pure philosophy, though, is literally is just liberty. People need to get along. Um, they shouldn't compel one another to do things against their will. We should try to live together as uh, humanity and not screw each other over any more than we have to. I like that mm-hmm. autonomy, self-respect, yeah. and, and love for others. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what drew me to Satanism. But uh, at the same time, I also never joined the COS. I was never a Church of Satan member because I didn't want to pay them money for stuff I already had access to. I was an independent Satanist. But then I left that behind, too, uh, because as I grew out of a- outright atheism into simply not caring, I rediscovered spirituality because Satanism left a vacuum in my life, too, because I had had those childhood experiences that I hadn't thought too much about. You know, I was too busy. I was, you know, becoming a young adult. I was too busy having a drink. I was never uh, lax in my studies or anything like that. I was more into that than socializing anyway offline at the time to begin with. Uh, but I re- sort of rediscovered that part of me. I'm like, why am I, uh, why am I being atheistic completely here and 
forgoing spirituality. Uh, you don't need to believe in a god to believe that there are things science hasn't quantified. But these are excellent phases that you went through. And I've told people, I see Satanism not as an, a result, but a stepping stone in my life. I had exactly. to clear out all the guilt and fear from Christianity from while I was religious, before I could enjoy life anyway and think critically. That led me to the occult, and to what you could call paganism, I suppose. I don't have a specific pantheon in mind. And I've told others, it, I, you shouldn't see any single spiritual experience as some sort of divine end result, this is the right way, because then you stagnate, and you limit yourself, you stop studying other paths. I'm still studying them now. It's like I've studied uh, mystic Christ uh, Christian works, like something by Hartman. Now, I'm not a Christian. I'm not going to become a Christian, but I'm still going to study it, because it potentially has something there that I should be studying. I want to study sure. it uh, from every path. Yeah, because you're an occultist. Yeah. And I think that's put in the real definition of occultism is that we study everything. We are sponges. Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't be like organized religion where they have one book. You read this one book, you know everything. No, you don't. It's just one book. How can you contain all human knowledge in there? And even if you could, then it's only human knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't give you anything really that deep. And half the time you have some priest or imam or rabbi interpreting it for you. Yeah, the middleman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like the shaman of Siberia as they started consuming the mushrooms themselves and then doling out their urine to people instead of letting them pick their own. That's interesting. They actually they dieted the plant. That's what the shaman calls that. They eat only that plant and they diet it and it grows in them basically spiritually. And then he urinated it out and gave them the purified form. Yeah, the musum. <laughs> They used to be, they gave them to the reindeer, and they'd drink the reindeer urine. That worked fine till the priest decided it wasn't okay anymore. And so their religion was destroyed. Well, it became corrupted. It became standardized, and that uh, inevitably corrupts everything it touches. Wow. I recently did ayahuasca in Hawaii this summer, and it was my first time. And I found, actually, that my body makes stronger DMT than ayahuasca does. <laughs> It's so interesting. And that's what I'm looking forward to is more people, basically their third eyes opening and waking up and they're kind of going to be tripping out because it's kind of like you took LSD, but you didn't take anything. Yeah, yeah psychedelics visual. can be useful. I think so. I think they're really spiritually groundbreaking and they're better counselors than any human. And I say that as being a counselor of almost 27 years, I think ayahuasca is a better counselor than I am. Yeah. Some of that, actually, my use of psychedelics led me away from atheism, too. Oh. Not, not as in, well, I saw, the, I saw the gods, so I can't be an atheist anymore. More just opening me up to the idea that I could possibly be wrong, even though I saw no evidence of deities or spirituality. And then when I started looking into spirituality, sort of synthesizing my experiences with what I was studying, I said, aha, spirituality can be real. I didn't care about theism. I stopped even worrying about it. I don't care if there's a god or a pantheon. I really don't. <laughs> people tell That's me, cool. you know, people tell me, oh, you're going to hell for denying, you know, insert god here. Okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, when I was using psychedelics was when I was in college, uh, mostly in sophomore year. Freshman year, all I had ever done was I took some morning glory seeds and smoked pot. I didn't try anything substantial till sophomore year, and I never got into the hard drugs uh, because I knew better, <laughs> primarily. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, I didn't think that I need to become a crackhead or something like that. Uh, but I tried uh, psilocybin, mescaline, LSD, most of the significant psychedelics. I did try ayahuasca once. I brewed it myself. It did. Uh, <laughs> it did. It did have an effect, but it was so disgustingly awful that I had the, the purge effect that you probably know of since you said you've used it. Uh, mm -hmm. Came a little bit too early for it to fully kick in and give me that full DMT experience. Um, but well, please, let me congratulate you for making your own ayahuasca. Wow. Yeah, uh, but it uh, it didn't have the full effects because, like I said, oh, man, was it, it was the most disgusting thing I've ever tasted in my life. I understand that it is putrid. The ayahuasca that I had, mostly you could taste the alcohol in it, the, the agent that keeps it okay for a while, because <laughs> they flew it in from, like, Peru. Yeah. Oh, it was, uh, 
yeah, I didn't have anything to make it more tolerable. You and could. You also didn't have a community of people around you telling you what was going on. Yeah, it was. Uh, oh, oh, I can still taste it in my mouth. Thinking of it, it's so bad. <laughs> It sounds like you're not going to do that again anytime no, soon. No, I've I've sworn off using any form of drugs, including like marijuana. Um, I garnered what I could from it. I don't need anything more from it, and it would probably just give me a negative experience anyway. Do you do any form of meditation? Uh, I do not generally meditate. No, I prefer to go out in nature. Uh, what I do instead of meditating, essentially. I'll go out in the woods or the garden or some other place where it happens to be quiet. And I just sort of ruminate and relax in nature. And what ends up happening after a while is I sort of lose track of time, of what I'm doing and so forth. And that gives me enough of a spiritual experience right there. And also, and this is something that I've said to people before, gardening is like being a god mm -hmm. in the most literal sense. You're determining where things live their entire span of life. You know, plants are generally immobile. You're determining where they live their entire existence. You're determining what their neighbors are, their numbers. Uh, you know, if you know anything about gardening, you're also responsible for their health. You So you can make them as healthy or diseased as you want to. I mean, people don't think this way. That is special. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually wonderful. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm totally into your gardening, and because my higher self is always using gardening as a way to say that we cultivate the soul, and they teach me through gardening terms. Yeah, gardening is. I think it was the Asian, uh, sorry, ancient Persians uh, that believed that gardening was sort of a godly endeavor to the point at which uh, typically only those that were at least of noble stock even had a garden. The basic principle, a lot of people think of gardening as sort of uh, uh, maybe a feminine thing to do, you know, tending your flowers. I don't. I think it's just a godly endeavor regardless. Yeah, way beyond gender. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is you being a full being and you are raising other beings. It's extremely intense. And then you get to eat them. Oh, yeah. It's good human stuff. Mm-hmm. What we're lacking so much in this day yeah. and age. Even when the deer come and they eat something, it's like, oh, well, okay, at least I got to see the deer. It is an exchange, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a community. I mean, you've got deer coming around, birds, I'm yeah. sure. Nature gives and nature takes away. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's your whole, like, friendship there with your, you know, your backyard or whatever. You definitely have a community there. So it's amazing to me. I mean, it's all alive and it gives you nourishment in more than one way. You go back there and you change your state of consciousness and you commune. That's amazing. So thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> it's beautiful. I think we all could use a little bit more of that. Of nature, definitely. Yeah. And people who are talking about nature <laughs> and how it's so kind and loving and good for us. Because really, I'm in the conspiracy world a lot. So I'm hearing all the negatives about everything. So that's why I like to bring some sunshine to the play that we have going on here. And that's definitely big sunshine because anybody can go out today, right now, and start gardening. There's Everything's there for you. All your YouTube videos, all your community that you would want, it's all there. So definitely... Plant a tomato for Tarl, everybody. <laughs> and then turn it into ketchup. <laughs> there you go. Show Tarl the ketchup you have made from your tomato garden. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, so uh, we were at, with you in college where you were experimenting. Let's go beyond that and to where you got to today. And also how you started on YouTube, because I've noticed you've been there for a while, mister. Yes, uh, I actually technically started YouTubing in 2007 on my original account, but that uh, uh, the focus of my channel at that time was just boredom. I was just making random videos, slapping some music on there. Uh, this channel that I use now, Sticks, Hex, and Hammer 666, wasn't really active until the end of 2008 for the most part. And at first it was primarily just me talking about um, drug policy, some current events, some minor spiritual topics, but nothing too intellectual. And over time it morphed and it kept changing and I started talking more about politics, especially in the last year. 
more about the occult, uh, getting more deeper and deeper into these subjects. And then it's paying off. Uh, you know, uh, I've had some degree of success in uh, making people aware of what's going on in the world. And my goal is really right now because the old guard TV newsprint media is dying. Well, something has to replace that, and it can't all be Infowars or Breitbart or Drudge. Some of that's going to have to come from individuals that aren't part of a company. They're not. They don't get paid for doing what they're doing unless it's grassroots support, like I have. Uh, no business pays me to pitch their products. No political party pays me to pitch their candidates, and that's important. It's it's not, not just myself. There are dozens of others on YouTube and many blogs, smaller sites that do the same thing, uh, and that's really the future of the media. And I drag in the spiritual component because it has purpose in my life. Of course, YouTube is still for me because I'm from the old guard of YouTube. It's still fundamentally about individuals making their own content that they're interested in and other people looking up what they're interested in. The fact that I'm also using it as a platform to become part of the new media, the real press of the people, by the people, and for the people, is in a way secondary to that. I wouldn't talk about current events that have no interest for me. Uh, sometimes people ask me about topics. I'm not really, I don't care about them or I have no strong opinion. I'm not going to talk about them. That's a very interesting point that you being a free agent, you get to pick your topics. You get to keep to your moral ground and what you find interesting. And I agree with that. And also that the alternative of the alternative is the next thing to go off. Basically, it's the next big thing, which is the YouTubers. Mm -hmm. And the Vimo Vimeos? <laughs> the male. <laughs> yes. Um, but I have seen this arc of people are getting sick of Infowars, especially, you know, Alex would at some point say the whole system is corrupt, and then he goes ahead and backs the candidate. So there's corruption there. It's yes, easy he's, to he's predicting the end, the end times any day now, and yet mm -hmm. he's still trying to sell people water filters. Yeah, and he's crying on camera. I mean, yeah. He's really going I, for it. I can, I can respect him for being extremely entertaining at times, and sometimes he does talk about actual news. But people can't lose sight of the fact that fundamentally, first and foremost, he's a multimillionaire businessman. His uh, income does not come from a grassroots personal donations like mine or many other YouTubers or bloggers. His comes from businesses that are pitching their products. Water filter company. Uh, pharmaceutical agency, literally, selling iodine, or his own company that he's branded. Um, seed survival kits and stuff like that. Uh, that's where he gets his income. I don't blame him for that. He's a businessman. Good for, good for him for doing well. But to pretend that that's the end-all, be-all of truth is not accurate. It's like I've gone after Henry uh, McCow before, uh, the Save the Males dude. Now, he's basically the original gangster of the... MRAs, the MGTOW people, men going their own way sort of crap. And I see him as part of a, a behavioral sink. He's just a lunatic. His site has ads for things like run your car off of water, um, the Illuminati are going to scalp us all, and so forth. People don't even understand anything about his background. They don't understand the, the sort of way these people operate. They are business people. That's fine. That's dandy. But their first goal is to make money. If they happen to present accurate info to you, it's secondary to that goal. I totally agree with you. And you're really good at exposing shysters. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't consider Jones to be a shyster because, I mean, it is infotainment. It is. Oh, I was talking about the, 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 form, the other man. That oh, Macau? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a shyster. <laughs> yeah, that's what you were coming yeah. off. You're throwing shade over there. But with I see the respect you have for Alex Jones and that you're just pointing out what their goals are. Yeah, it's like the weekly world news. That's also, that's literal fake news, you know, most of the time. Uh, but but it's primarily a business. They're trying to make money. I don't have anything against them, but it's not exactly the best source for your information. There are far more people that are capable of analyzing things politically, spiritually, whatever, uh, that have, they're more keyed into reality than Alex Jones. He's more this entertaining than many of them. Like on my channel, you're getting mostly educational content. You're not, I'm not going to go off the rails and start yelling about the Illuminati. I realize that that's entertaining, 
uh, it's something that people share around more. It's more likely to go viral. I'm just not willing to sort of whore myself out to that, you know. Yeah, that's the difference again, because you're of being autonomous, of being your own uh, producer, basically. Yeah. That you don't have to be sensational or kowtow to screaming fits about the Illuminati, where that really works for Alex Jones. Yeah. But this is the first time I've really seen such a large uh, exodus, so to speak, of YouTubers like yourself differentiating themselves from what now we term as the alternative media, because we don't have a new name for it. We can only say alternative twice, <laughs> you know, the alternative to the alternative. And just so many people are pushing away that we're not like Alex Jones. We're not going to go through those swamps. Well, <laughs> another problem some people have is they just target like Alex Jones or Breitbart or something. I would say uh, the alternative media of the old guard is now in two camps. Those that have joined the dying mainstream media, like Salon, Being Liberal, some of the Facebook pages and YouTubers, and that's far worse. And those that remain alternative media, like Infowars, Breitbart, Drudge, um, and including some, some left-leading outlets, something like Jezebel, but they've become more like business endeavors than they were originally. Originally, they were more about disseminating information over time, uh, their their income mounted. They saw how profitable it was, and they ran with it. Now, I don't have a problem with that. Like I said, that includes left, right, center, libertarian, authoritarian. Okay, to do what you need to do for your business because that's what it is. Uh, but when you present yourself as some sort of messiah against some imagined Illuminati enemy, like Jones does, mm -hmm. or 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 somebody like that. And at the same time, you're not honest enough to tell people, primarily my goal here is to make money, to solicit corporate cash in some way or manner. That, I think, is problematic. The problem is it doesn't do enough. You, you're using the same strategy the legacy media uses. You will eventually become like the legacy media if you are ever empowered to do so. If you're, if It's like uh, Alex Jones is near the Young Turks in viewership. The Young Turks operate exactly like any legacy media outlet on a lower budget. They're just MSNBC for YouTube. I uh, totally agree yeah, with you on that. Yeah, Alex Jones is is running the risk, and this would be uh, this would be advice I would give him if I was able to have a conversation with him. Keep your autonomy. If it means making less money and more independent content, good. People will respect you more. Your business will continue. Yes, you'll make a little less money, but your business will stay relevant for the next decade or two as we go through all these changes. We're seeing there are individuals on YouTube now that have more support than entire networks. You're seeing individual blogs that have more traffic than news sites. That's not going to change. It's going to get more and more and more as more parts of the world enter the lexicon of the Internet, parts of West Africa, parts of South Asia, parts of you know, Latin America, more and more communities are hooking up to the Internet for the first time. It's going to keep growing and growing and growing. These larger sites that used to be totally alternative media, five years ago InfoWars was total fringe, are becoming more like the lamestream media, and they're going to they'll temporarily succeed, but they will corrupt themselves in the process and die off, and nobody will trust them. The sort of audience they've once fielded will leave them, and they'll leave them behind for YouTubers or some individual Facebook page or something. That would be my advice to them, if they wish to continue succeeding for more than the short term. That's, that's excellent advice. And again, it goes back to morality and autonomy. <laughs> yeah, if you're not autonomous, then you can't change rapidly enough to keep up with a total paradigm shift. Yeah, it's like I admit, I have to sell my books, and I use YouTube to market them, to make a living. But I'm not getting funded to any significant degree or, well, any degree now, but, you know, nobody's funding me from a business front. No bank is funding me. Individuals are. Well, and, and you have a, a site where people can actually contribute to you? Yeah, I, I have a Patreon account, and people are donating whatever they can, but they're private individuals. These are, it's not Citibank or NASCAR or, so, or Red Bull. I, if Red Bull wanted to donate to me, they'd just send me cases of Red Bull. I advertise that anyway because I drink it on a daily basis. But mm -hmm. <laughs> just as a humorous aside, but I'm not getting funded by some business. I don't have a business brand. I'm an editor of Arcana and a writer of some books, and I get donations. 
Yeah, it's very humble. You're not even taking rat ad revenue yeah, from. I I oppose it because when I first joined YouTube, there were no ads other than side ads. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Pro- partially, probably people respect that fact because I'm not inconveniencing them. Secondly, when I got to YouTube, there were ads on the side of the video, but there were no ads that you had to click through on the video. So your book on occult memetics has a, a meme war in it and all kinds of things. I've got to read a little bit of it on Amazon, and I found it quite interesting. And I am very into art and symbolism as a tarot expert, so let's go for it. Well, the concept of memetics, uh, I, I mostly strip it away from the Dawkins sort of sense, because that's a little bit outdated. People, when they talk about memes today, they almost entirely mean cartoons with a caption on them, or something, or a viral video, um, or some statement that happens to become popular, like Little Marco, or, or you know, Lion Ted or something. You saw memetics used successfully in the last campaign. Well, I would like to get to the etymology of the word, though, which means imitated thing in Greek. Yeah, I thought. Can you explain that. Well, I, I'm not sure about if I would use the term imitated so much as replicated. Um, it's a, a thought, an idea, or a conveyance of the same that replicates itself. The internet is helping memetics greatly because then a thought can jump from a person to another person without direct contact without direct contact with a book or a newsprint or something, it's also more instantaneous. In the past, it wasn't. You'd print up the books, you'd send them out. A week later, people get ideas in a mimetic sense. Now it's somebody made a tweet. It's instantly to a million people. It's far faster. So Richard Dawkins plus Darwinism came up with the, well, 1976 meme situation, right? Yes. And putting those two together, they are using the clinical terms of of how diseases are communicable between people. Mm-hmm. So they're going off a scientific medical model of how information or disease is spread. Is that correct? Yeah, it's part of biological evolution, the same as human language. The expressions behind a meme uh, operate in the same manner as the memes themselves. Language evolves over time, too, in usefulness. And that we can look at a meme and get an instant knowledge. Like, the first time I saw tarot cards, I did not gain an instant knowledge of what the card meant. But when we get these memes, it's almost as if it hits you straight in the third eye and you understand. What is that power? Well, the basis for it is a universal understanding of what it means. It's like, uh, in occult memetics, I make a point that I haven't seen anyone else mention. I'm sure somebody's probably thought of this, so I'm not going to claim like credit for the idea. Uh, you have to go to the lowest possible denominator of human thought and design something as simplistic as possible, irreducible complexity matters in memetics, that can convey a message. For instance, smug Pepe, which everyone was up in arms about during the election. Oh, it's racist Pepe Frog, it's Keck, it's uh, an Egyptian god. The reason why it spread so easily... It doesn't need a caption. It doesn't need any explanation. It can be a person in any language will understand what that image means. The image is the irreducible figure of smugness, of feeling self-satisfied, maybe egotistical. I can show that image to almost anyone in the world, and they'll know what feeling it conveys without even needing an actual language associated with it. it. It completely cuts out the middleman of language entirely and goes to an even lower level. And it operates in, a, in the manner of propaganda. Propaganda does this all the time. We like to call it mind control over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's another way you could describe it. Um, it can, and spiritual propaganda in the mimetic sense hijacks the human psyche much more effectively than secular propaganda. Um, there's a reason why strongman leaders typically, they'll have images drawn up of themselves associated with some deity, some spiritual topic. Yeah, this happened with Trump. They have pictures of Trump as Jesus or Trump as God or something like that. It's uh, it's the same basic concept. It hijacks the human psyche. Spirituality hijacks it and tells a person you will die in, in a in internal sense if you don't do X, Y, and Z. So if you take that same spiritual imagery and overlap it onto a political subject or a social subject, 
it makes it more effective. It's an almost universal human tendency based on biology. It's the way we've evolved for, you know, 10,000 years. Well, I would say that religion versus spirituality, because spirituality doesn't tell you you're going to die. It tells you maybe you're going to be immortal. Well, so. yes, but the more successful spiritual imagery, the reason why organized religion works well is because it can hijack the human psyche. If I just tell people my spiritual beliefs and I say, there is no hell, there's no punishment for not doing as I say, then it, the message doesn't replicate itself as well. But if I tell them, unless you do this, you will certainly die and suffer forever, because I've hijacked their survival mechanism, it makes that message replicate more easily. This is why the religions that tend to grow the best are the most violent. They are the most evil and insane. They lie the most. They have the worst dogma. That's why they spread well, because their followers become vicious. They become violent. Islam and Christianity, this sort of false dichotomy of these two warring religions, the reason why they're the largest religions is because they're violent. It's because they say, you will, we should kill those who don't believe in, in the way we do. Uh, we must stomp them out of existence. We must take over the world. Uh, everything must be ordered according to our plans, or else all shall fall into darkness. That's why they're so Yeah, successful. that definitely sounds like the evil overlords of the universe, doesn't it? Yeah, and then they justify their religions and call themselves good in order to hijack people's more emotional tendencies. And then they molest our children. Yes, yeah. Yeah, only so, it's only it's more legal that. on the Islamic side than on the Christian side. I see. Yes, <laughs> of course. The Christians are still trying to keep up some kind of a facade of a white light mm -hmm. in that sense, because that draws people in, you know, just like they said, Satan can come as an angel of light. Well, hello. <laughs> yeah. The Christians found themselves in the midst of a developed world, and so they had to modernize at least the appearance of their message. Islam never had that happen outside of maybe Dubai or, you know, some of these major cities. So they still say, well, the strong shall survive. No, we don't, we don't represent mercy, we represent strength. That's why Islam, unfortunately, is winning the war against Christianity, because they've retained that uh, inclination. They don't need a facade, because nobody expects them to have one. Like you said, the darkest one will win, and yeah. I would definitely vote for the Muslim. I did a report on them as a child. I was only like seven years old, and I read about the religion, and it freaked me out then. Yeah. Interesting, uh, but I do like respect the Sikh religion, so I'm not saying you know I do my research and I look into things. Uh, but they are religions; they are not spiritualities. Yeah, there, there there's uh, no real spirituality in organized religion because it becomes politicized. Because if it isn't, it gets outcompeted and it can't replicate. It's like the hindrance of a virus. It's a and it's an astonishing concept when we talk about memetics. I do believe it is, and it's got a flip dichotomy to it, too. It's got the higher side of it, like tarot. I have helped thousands of people through years of work with these little pieces of art, when you think about it. Yet, you know, a meme, I guess, can make somebody go home and cry. Yeah, or it can help them in their life. It can convince them that things are okay, or it can convince them to wake up and see that things aren't. It can be used for benevolent purposes. Mm -hmm. So let's get into your philosophy about the meme world. Well, my philosophy is I try to use it primarily to perpetuate liberty because I'm a libertarian. I've come to that perspective both politically and uh, spiritually. But I also realize that I'm in the minority. Most people, uh, if they are capable of spawning propaganda at all, they're doing it just for entertainment, um, just spreading funny memes for no purpose other than their own entertainment and the, and the entertainment of others. Or they're spreading false information for a, a purpose of propaganda. They might be a government agent or they might just have a strong opinion that they just happen to have. Or they might be a shill paid for by some corporation or something. Or they use it to line their pockets or something along those lines because that's how humans tend to operate. And the memes actually affect the ones using them, too, because over time, if, if they're really good at the propaganda, they'll even eventually fool themselves. It's sort of like the Nishi, if you stare too long into the abyss, it will begin to stare back, I suppose. That is awesome, because that is a twilight zone point where you can flip into the higher dimensions. Yeah. 
Yeah, or or lower, however you happen to interpret it. Yeah, which is great. That's why I like talking to you because you're constantly reminding me of the dichotomy because usually I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's amazing that you you constantly bring up like the lower dimension and that it is happening right now and it's still here and we're all going through it collectively. So you really help balance me out. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of light workers could get a lot from watching your channel, you know, get grounded, get real. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, they, but they'd have to uh, be prepared to be challenged a bit, too. I think that any occultist who is also a light worker is up for the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that is a special, very League of Gentlemen kind of thing, isn't it? The, the most amusing thing of all is that memetics, even where you're talking about the spiritual side, doesn't even require a spiritual belief uh, to believe in it. You can be the, a total anti-spiritualistic atheist and still understand how propaganda operates. Memetics is just an extension and explanation of it that uses human biology to explain how it uh, how it operates. Yeah, how it goes from one person to another and yeah. creates change in the crucible of magic, like yeah. the subconscious yeah. of the mind. It, it literally hijacks human psyche. But also, I had a kundalini awakening, and during that time period... Uh, one day I woke up and understood all these symbols everywhere, like not just my tarot cards, like all the symbols and logos of the corporations came alive at once, basically, while I was in the middle of the street, and all of the symbology came at me. So it was like a, an awakening, a big awakening in that aspect, and I was like, oh my gosh, they're using all of these symbols to keys and codes to the human psyche to get people to buy things and I was in a state of anxiety when I realized this, but a voice came through and said, don't worry, God is the God of all symbols. God has the power beyond all symbols. You know, like, it's the essence of the thing. The essence is positive, I think, because it comes from a higher realm. So therefore, it's just a little bit of code change in the matrix, so to speak, mm -hmm. to get the symbols to turn positive. That's if actually that an important point that you make, because ultimately, it doesn't even matter if the forces of evil win, because eventually it all gets smashed to pieces and starts again. So even the most malevolent, sort of destructive aspects of humanity, should they take hold completely and enslave all of mankind, Eventually, they get destroyed, too, in time. Uh, we've, we've had periods in human history where large swaths of humanity were utterly depraved and enslaved um, to materialism or to a tyrant or whatever it happens to be. And it always ends up passing in time. So you see that, you know, there's a constant healing yeah. going on, and even though it might look bad. And likewise, the best aspects of humanity, we think about the revolutionary period, this country was founded on liberty. We're obviously far from it at this point. They get corrupted over time. It leads to the worst aspects of man. Things collapse suddenly. They go back to the beginning. And it keeps happening over and over and over again, no matter what the individual circumstances are. Well, that would say, you know, from the other perspective over here, is Earth is a school, and, and you come here to learn, and that's why it's so hard. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we can give for this life being so difficult and the buddhists call this place samsara world of suffering so it's kind of like the buddhist hell we live in and see i see it from the epicurean perspective of it doesn't necessarily have to be that way but at the same time there's no stability and so there's no way to lock in the virtues of mankind there will always be struggle and there will always be corruption but it's important to you to be virtuous. So what is that within you? Is that part of the pleasure-seeking aspect? No, it's just a deep-seated belief that you have to fight for your beliefs, physically or mentally. You have, to be, you have to be... In the old days, people had to take up arms to fight for their virtue. Now you don't need to do that, generally. You can fight with ideas. Um, until there's a collapse, and then you'll have to take up swords again. But what are you fighting well, I fight against uh, th authoritarianism, wrongful authority, spiritual notions that lead to false authority, um, anything along those lines. Certain aspects of uh, groups that claim to be the saviors of mankind while being utterly corrupt. 
the ultimate charlatan is somebody who sees a problem and they sell people a cure, almost always at profit, by the way, that is really simple. It fulfills the need for a solution without actually solving the problem. Government does this. It's a form of propaganda. They create a problem. They tell people, give us a little bit more money or a little bit more power and we can solve this problem <laughs> that we created. And then this perpetuates itself. That's why nations collapse. I think the Wall Street crash was a brilliant example of that, <laughs> how they took the American, the poor worker money, the slaves already, and took the slave money because they were gambling. Yeah. No, sorry we screwed your future. Just give us higher tax rates and we'll solve this problem. Thank you so much for joining us in the Cosmic Core today, Tarl. And tell us the name of that book again and how we can get to your website and all of your goodies on YouTube. Well, thank you for having me on your show. And the name of the book is Occult Memetics. Uh, it is available through Amazon. The easiest way to find it uh, is at the Tarl Warwick Books blog, which is the blog in lieu of an actual website. Uh, that I've got set up for all of my works. There are tabs there where people can navigate to whatever category they'd like. Excellent. I've been to your website several times, and I find it that every time I go back, there is something new and different to look at, and it's very intriguing. It, it's black and white, so it's like this basic thing, but it's so deep. So, guys, direct your browsers to Tarl's website, and all the links are below. Thank you for joining us today. We've had almost a two-hour show. Two oh, very else. entertaining hours. Thank you. I really enjoyed speaking with you, and I do hope we do get to speak again in the future. I think that we're a pretty good team coming from totally different aspects, but being friends in the middle. So, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, User Occult Priestess, and go deeper still into the rabbit hole with me. Seek the teachings of emotional, mental, and physical healing with both my blog, The Occultist in the Corner, WordPress, or over 100 videos posted to YouTube. And please donate at occultpriestess.com.